Ephesians chapter number 3. We're going to go back to this, um, this prayer that Paul uh, finishes this, the first half of the book of Ephesians with. We've been looking at it at some length here. And uh, we're going to look again at the third petition in it. Uh, you know, most of the time when people talk about prayer, they're, they're sort of like the guy, you heard about the guy that got the job of painting the, the, the white line down the middle of the highway? And the first day, he, he, he's all excited, and he painted that line six miles long. The next day, he painted it, but he only got three miles. Then the next day, he only got about a half a mile. So his boss came to him the next day. He says, you know, boy, you start out six miles. And be the next day, so you, what's going on? He said, boss, I'm doing the best I can, but every day I get further away from the paint bucket. <laughs> you understand the problem now, okay? And I know that's lame, but the point is that some people just don't ever catch on. You know, it's kind of obvious what you should. And, and prayer is that way. Uh, everybody prays. Every religion prays. Uh, people that don't believe in God pray. Let them, get in the, let them get in trouble, what we call foxhole prayers. Everybody cries out for help. And, and yet, in the Scripture, prayer is something very, very special. Friday night, when we had the, the Friday night fellowship, we had a, had a uh, good group of folks here, and the conversation was about prayer. And I was, uh, I was quite impressed, uh, kind of struck by the, uh, the maturity with which folks, our, our folks can talk about that particular issue. You know, most of the time when people talk about prayer, it's, it, it's really kind of juvenile, almost to the point of superstition. And it's good to be able to see people grounded in sound doctrine that give them the ability to kind of look at it from a, from a mature understanding kind of perspective so that it can be the asset in your life that God designed it to be. Uh, there are assets that God gives us as believers that are designed to put our Christian life into operation. One is you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, His life. You have, you have the written Word of God. You have the local church to give you a context in which to, to, to operate with other believers, a, a community, a family to operate with. You have the teaching of sound doctrine. But in, 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 in order to activate all those things, there's the asset of prayer, uh, prayer according to the way God operates today. And that's what this, this context that we're studying here in Ephesians 6, uh, chapter 3, rather, is, is dealing with is the issue of God, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, praying for us. And so it kind of tells us how it works. Verse 16, he says, here it is, that, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. So the first thing Paul's praying for is that God's Spirit would work in your inner man. The Holy Spirit of God works indirectly today. He's not out moving, you know, moving mountains and, and cold fronts and and hurricanes and, and, and adding zeros to your bank account and, and shooing away, uh, you know, viruses and cancers. What he's doing today is his word. God the Holy Spirit always works through his word and his word working in your inner man. In other words, there's an inner man operation. God working inside of us, then living out through us. But the life and the compulsion and the, and the life of God is inside. And he works in directly through his word resident in us. So the first thing Paul prays for is that the Spirit of God would strengthen you with his miracle working power in your inner man. Be strengthened with might by his spirit in your inner man. That the word of God would work, the, ex the exceeding greatness of the power of God's word would work in, in you, inside of you, in your heart, in your inner man, that... When that happens, Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. When Christ dwells in your heart, that is, he's the focus. You become occupied with him, not everything else. That, verse 17, ye being rooted and grounded in love. Now, we talked about that last time. You see how he says that, ye, and then he says, comma, being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend the ye, ye being rooted and grounded in love is really sort of a, a, an appositive to describe what happens to you when you have, you're strengthened by His Spirit and you're in a man, and you have Christ dwelling in your hearts. When, when it's the Word of God working effectually in your understanding, your faith resting in it, focusing on Him, setting your affections on things above, 
you, you're rooted and grounded in his love for us. And then he says, now I want you to be able to comprehend with all the saints. And this is what we talk about today. What is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height? And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you may be filled with, the, with all the fullness of God. That third petition is probably the one petition in the prayer that gives mo most commentators the most difficulty. Because he doesn't really, he almost, he, he almost it's, it's, it's almost kind of, well, it's just, how can I say it? It's hard for him to understand. That's just the easiest way to say it, isn't it? Look how he says it. That you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ. Now, most time you, you hear that said, it says that he wants you to be able to comprehend what is the breadth, length, depth, and height of the love of Christ, but you notice it didn't say that. It says he wants you to be able to comprehend what is, with all the saints, with everybody, this is not something for a, for a particular small elitist group. This is not something limited to a, to, to a privileged few. Everybody, every saint, every member of the body of Christ is to be able to comprehend this. That's exciting. <laughs> that means I can learn it. That means you can learn it. It's not just for a few. Comprehend what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height and having done that, to know the love of Christ. So if you're going to know the love of Christ, you're going to be able to comprehend the love of Christ, it's going to be because you understand, you comprehend the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. But you notice it didn't tell you of what? The breadth, the length, the depth, and height of what, Paul? So that's where the commentaries get, they get off, they jump off the end of the, the pier. My dad used to say you take a long walk on a short pier. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> you get wet. <laughs> and the, the, the thing is, there, the, in, in, in grammar, there's a thing called an ellipsis. If I say to you, shut the door, okay, if you write that sentence down, shut the door, shut, that's the verb, door, the object, what's the subject? You. But you see, it's not in the, it's not in the sentence. It's you understood. And sometimes something will be there, you understand it's there. I don't have to say, you shut the door, boy shut the door, David shut the door, Noah shut the door. What I can say, shut the door. And you understand that's the commands for you. The context tells you who's supposed to shut the door. Okay? In the context here, what's the subject of chapter 3? The whole concept in chapter 3 is this great mystery that's been revealed through Paul. So when you think about, you come down here and he doesn't put the, t the sub subject there, it's pretty obvious he's expecting you, hey, what I'm talking about is what I want you to be able to comprehend, the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height of. Okay? So the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height of what? Of what he calls in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. This plan, this great cosmic plan that God has for his son, that he focuses on the Lord Jesus Christ, all that God's doing through the Lord Jesus Christ, he wants you to see the dimensions of all of that. They want you to be able to comprehend it. I love that word comprehend. Um, <laughs> comprehend, apprehend, th those terms, the word comprehend it, it come, you see the prehend at the end of it? Apprehend, comprehend. The word comes from a Latin word, prehendere. A monkey has a prehensile tail. Did you know that? And I, aren't you glad you came to know about monkeys today? <laughs> a prehensile tail. That word prehend. What a prehensile tail is, is it means that the monkey's got a tail that can grasp on to a limb and hold on and not let go, get a grip on it. You ever hear the song, um, monkey wrapped his tail around the flagpole to get a better hole to see the monkey bowl? You never heard that, okay. <laughs> That's the nursery rhyme version of the Stars and Stripes Forever. <laughs> But what, what does a monkey do? His tail. And if he gets a grip on it, he can swing. He can do it. But he let, and that word prehend is the idea of to grasp something and to hold on to it and not let it go. 
Well, when you comprehend, you take your mind and you get a grip on something. You get your mind around it so that you grasp it. And you, can't, and you don't let it go. You make it your own. It's mine. I, I got it. Okay? Now, the fascinating thing is, he says in verse number 19, to know the love of Christ, which passes, passeth knowledge. Now, wait a minute. I'm supposed to comprehend, get my mind around, grasp something that's past knowing. My son, my grandson last night, he, he said, uh, that's the drum. That's the cymbal. <laughs> well, I'm going to have my, my forehead's going to be red like his was. Now, he's, you know, he's just turned seven years old. The, when you're old as I am, you shouldn't hit yourself in the head quite so hard. <laughs> but you know the... I could have had a V8, you know, that kind of thing. And you say, what is that? I mean, I can't get it. But really, it's, it's not that difficult when you look at what it says. You may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, and depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. When he says the love of Christ passeth knowledge, he's not saying you can't know it because he just told you God can give you the capacity, the supernatural ability. It takes the power of God, but you can comprehend this stuff. So you can grasp it. You can get your mind around it. You can get a hold of it. When he says it passes knowledge, what he's talking about there is that it's, never, it's a never-ending process. You remember that verse over in Timothy where it says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth? When you... When you, when, you, when you begin to comprehend the love of Christ, you begin to know it, but soon you realize, I'm never really going to get it all. I can comprehend some of it, and as soon as I've got that, I realize there's more to it. So when he says, the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, he's talking about it's a never-ending process. It's something you never come to the end of. Now let's go back just a minute before we get that far ahead of ourselves and look back at verse number 18. That we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. That word comprehend, again, is the idea of get a grip on. Go, go back with me, if you will, to the book of Job. Let me just show you a couple of ways, ways it's used in the Bible. Because your Christian life is not designed to operate on the basis of ignorance. Your Christian life is not designed to operate on the basis of emotion. Your Christian life is designed to operate on the, on the basis of your faith responding to an intelligent understanding of God's Word to you. I understand that the average church doesn't function that way. There's rites, rituals, repetitive kind of things. You go over and over again. You know how all that stuff works. You've been there, done that. But there's a liberating thing about understanding and not just knowing some things, but being able to get a grip on them so that I, I comprehend them. Job chapter 37, Job, uh, Elihu is talking about God. He says, verse number 5, God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he, which we cannot comprehend. God can do some things that you'll never be able to get your mind around. Okay? So the idea of comprehending it has to do with being able to intellectually grasp it with our thinking. Come with me to John chapter 1. Here's, here's, here's one that really kind of speaks to it. John chapter 1, verse number 4. Verse 3, all things were made by him, that's the Lord Jesus. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth into darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Now when you read that verse, you say, wait a minute. How do you get rid of darkness? You turn on the light. But here's a light that shines in the darkness, and darkness doesn't get it. So obviously we're not talking about a physical light. 
We're talking about a spiritual light and a spiritual darkness. Look over at chapter 3. John 3, verse number 19. Jesus says to Nicodemus, this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. Now, who is the light? Well, he's the light. He, said, he just said he's the light that lights all men. John 8, he says, I'm the light of the world. Jesus comes in, the light, this is the light, this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why do they do that? Because their deeds are evil. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, Paul talks to the Ephesians and he says, You once were darkness. You see, there's a spiritual darkness. There's a blindness. The Bible says that if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. There is a spiritual darkness into which light can shine, and the darkness doesn't get it, can't grasp it, cannot comprehend it. Well, the opposite is true for you and me. He says what he's talking about in Ephesians is the fact that we can. He's, we're able, <laughs> and I, I guess that word able is what sticks in my, my mind, uh, that you may be able to comprehend. You see, it isn't something that just naturally happens. The ability to comprehend, it's going to come through the sound doctrine that's there in God's Word. And you're going to be able to grasp in your thinking, grasp in your understanding what it is that God is doing. Hold your hand. You've you got Ephesians. Come back with me to the book of Job, chapter 11. Now here's a contrast. Job, chapter 11. Zophar is talking here, one of Job's they're all, all these guys are called Job's friends. He calls them miserable comforters. <laughs> because they were, they, were, they were pretty miserable comforters. They didn't do a very good job of comforting poor Job. At one point he calls and he says, you're full of the east wind. You're a bunch of windbags. You know, when you, if you want to have some fun, sit down and read the book of Job. Just read it quickly. Don't, don't, don't ponder on it. Just read, and watch these guys argue with one another. You think guys on a debate, you know, these political debates are having to call each other names? These dudes get on with it. <laughs> and you get about halfway into it and you say, whew, let's take a break here. Let, let, you know, get the fan out and fan these guys down because they get after it. Zophar, verse number, chapter 11, he, he's, he's uh, uh, well, he says, verse 2, Should not the multitude of words be answered? Should a man full of talk be justified? You just jabber, 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 Job, but you don't say anything that makes any sense. Verse number 7, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty under perfection? Well, the answer, of course, at that point is no. They can't. Now watch. It is it, knowing God, is as high as heaven. What canst, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. There are those four dimensions in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 3, I'm sorry. He says, can you find out, God? It's high as heaven. It's deeper than hell. It's longer than the earth and it's broader than the sea. It's the breadth, the length, the depth, the height. It's too much. You can't get there. All these things about God. Job, you think you're going to figure God out? Forget it. The first book in the Bible ever written, the book of Job, one of the oldest books in human history, starts out by saying, to know God, to figure Him out, to reach Him out to perfection, it's too much for you. It's too high, it's too deep, it's too wide, it's too, too broad, too long. Ephesians 3, Paul says the opposite. I like that. I like Ephesians 3. He says, now God has given you the capacity to comprehend, not just to know, but to monkey wraps his tail around the flagpole to get a better hole. You can get a grip on this, and you can know the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And when you know the breadth, the length, and depth, and the height of God's eternal plan for his creation, then you can know something about the love of Christ because it's all founded in that. 
Now, the reason Paul can say what he did is chapter 1, verse number 9. Ephesians 1, verse 9. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. And the his there in the context is the Father. So God the Father has made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. So God the Father had a plan. He purposed it in himself. He's now made known the mystery of his will. If you come to chapter 3, hold on to chapter 1. Verse number 3, Paul says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote afore in few words, wherever you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed in his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. You notice there is a mystery, a secret. That is something that previously was not made known to the sons of men that is now revealed. Well, you know in your Bible, from the time of Genesis on, God was revealing his plan. That's what the Bible calls prophecy. Acts chapter 3, verse 21, Peter talks about that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. So there's a plan and a purpose that God had in his creation that he preached about, spoke about, made known since the world began. But there's, there's this other pr purpose, this other plan. He called it a mystery, a secret, which he kept hidden since the world began. Chapter 3, verse 9, he says, To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. So you have two plans. You have two things going on in the Bible, two programs. When the Bible talks about right, rightly dividing the word, that's the most basic division that there is. There's a plan that God has made known since the world began, and there's a plan he kept secret since the world began, but now, through the ministry committed to the Apostle Paul by the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven, he's made known. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, now go back to chapter 1, verse 9. He's abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. What is that mystery of his will? That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. So just like he has two programs, he has two spheres of operation for those programs. And he has two agencies, an agency for the earth, the nation Israel, agency for the heavens, the body of Christ in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So God the Father literally has taken us back into the council meeting that the Trinity had before the foundation of the world. And he said, here, let me show you the board minutes from the meeting that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had before the world began, before he ever created anything, before Jesus Christ stepped out on nothing and created the heaven and the earth, the plan that he was executing, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit had already agreed to back in the eternity past. And Paul says, what I want you to be able to do is to comprehend with all the saints the breadth, the length, the, the depth, and the height of that plan that the Godhead has when it created all things. Now, when he talks about the breadth of it, there in chapter 3, all, the, all these dimensions are, are, are defined for you in the book of Ephesians. The breadth of something, how wide is it? We'll look back at chapter 2, verse number 11. Because in, in, in the prophetic program, the breadth of it wasn't the word escapes me. The breath of it wasn't broad. Okay, that, that's good. <laughs> you don't have to find a word with a word. That works. It, it, it was not the, the, the it was a, it, there was an exclusivity to it. Chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ. So in time past, 
there was a division. There was the circumcision and the uncircumcision. The uncircumcision are down here. The circumcision are up here. The promises and the covenants that God made with people, he made with these people here. Verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he came back here in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Romans chapter 9 says as concerning the, the flesh, Christ came to these people here. These people down here, he doesn't come to them. He comes to these people up here. He comes to the nation Israel. He's a minister of the circumcision. That's why when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read the stuff, the, the in, instructions in those books, if you try to take the instructions that are in these books and, and obey them today, you get absolute confusion in your life. Now, I know people don't like me saying that, but I said nonetheless because it's true. I got an email from someone this past week, and a preacher, he didn't like something that I said, which, uh, <laughs> okay. And he says, don't you say that at Pentecost, that's such Jews. So I wrote him back and said, well, brother, I didn't say anything about that. I just quoted Acts 2, 14, 22, and 36. Because three times Peter says, you men of Judea, you men of Israel, let all the house of Israel know. I said, I didn't say he was talking to Jews. He said he was. If you don't like what the Bible says, that's fine. That's your business. You go argue with God. I'm not arguing. Argue with Peter about who he was talking about. <laughs> don't kill the messenger. This stuff back here. Jesus Christ told his apostles, he says, go not in the way of the Gentiles. Well, if Jesus Christ, in his, when he commissioned the 12 apostles in Matthew 10 with their great commission, told them, don't go to the Gentiles, then that means he, t he says, don't preach in Chicago. Somebody says, well, I'm going to do it because Jesus did it. You won't do that. You see, what happens is you, you become a... To go back here and claim these passages and say they are you, you make a liar out of yourself or out of God. I mean, hello, that's it. You know God isn't lying, so the must, problem must be with you. So you start wondering, well, if you said, we talk about prayer, all things whatsoever you are asking prayer, believing you shall receive, and you, so you go out and ask for all things, you know, the dude on the radio, he says, you shouldn't be driving a rusted out Toyota. You ought to be driving a Porsche like me because, you know, if you had faith to believe, so you go out and you say, well, I must, must be something wrong with me. I must not have faith to believe. you got faith enough to move God Almighty out of heaven into your heart by trusting his son. And you can't get a, something better than a Toyota? Well, there's something wrong. Yeah, there is something wrong. You know what it is? What you're talking about is what's wrong. But people say, well, see, if you was like me, if you're good as me, well, you'd be doing. That stuff back there hasn't got anything to do with you and me. It has something to do with what God's doing. Listen, you're not going to be big enough a day in your life to make God do something he isn't doing. What you need to do, what I need to do is find out what God's doing Believe that and let that be what, what works in our life. Quit trying to tell God what to do and find out what God's doing and then go do that. That won't work for you because that's not you. It's God. God's got more people in his program than just you. You're not, the only, you're not the only dude God ever thought about. Body of Christ, not the only plan God ever had. There's other people beside us. They deserve part of the Bible much as we deserve part of the Bible. They need part as much they need as much part of the Bible as much as you need part of the Bible. They need instructions about them just like you need instructions about you. So quit thinking everything's about you and demand that it all be yours. Just let it be who God said it was. You can relax. Sit down, take a breath, chill out. It'll work. He knows what he's doing. So in time past. Book of Acts starts out, Christ ascends into heaven, the Holy Spirit comes here, and there's nothing changes over here from back there. How do I know? I can read Hebrews 2 verse 3. He says, 
about these people over here. How should we escape so great, if we neglect so great salvation, which is the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God bearing them witness with signs and gifts and miracles and, and divers miracles of the Holy Ghost. So what's happening over here as Acts begins is they're continuing that program right there. Now, if you look at verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So there comes a point where you move from time past into but now, and the but now is you who were far off are now made nigh. How, how are you made nigh? Through the fall of Israel, salvation goes to the Gentiles. He changed the program. And he does away with this, with this distinction back here where you have some on the wrong side and some on the inside. And he says, now everybody's concluded unbelief. Everybody's on the wrong side now. And now, over here, he's going to form a body of believers called the church, the body of Christ, out of anybody down here that'll trust him. That'll move from unbelief to belief. He's concluded all in unbelief, Romans 11 says, that he might have mercy on all. So the message today is by grace you are saved through faith in what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary. And today, it doesn't make any difference who you are, where you come from, what you look like, what your past is, good, bad, or indifferent, what your financial status is, what your educational status is, it doesn't make any difference about all of that. We're all, there's no difference for all have sinned. And today, the, today we sing the song, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. No man stands higher than I. I can call on Jesus' name and a king can do the same. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's room at the cross for you. You see, Though millions have come, there's still room for you. It's for everybody. And the breadth of it today, and the reason that's important, is because at one time the breadth wasn't. Back here he says, the Son of Man gave his life a ransom for many. Paul says, now I'm testifying this due time testifier that he gave his life a ransom for all. Paul says, I want you to comprehend the breadth of this. I want you to appreciate how broad this has become, how fantastic what God's doing today where he's included everybody. The breadth of it, the length of it. You're in chapter 3, look at chapter 3, verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which you purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see what kind of purpose this is? It's called eternal. You and I are given eternal life. We're given everlasting life. Now, the difference between eternal and everlasting is kind of interesting. Eternal means it has no beginning and no end. Everlasting means it has no end. It's going to last forever. You get both. The moment you trust Jesus Christ, you get life that will never end. But it's also eternal life because it's something that God planned before the foundation of the world. Back here before he created anything, he planned to do this thing out here. He planned to form the body of Christ. Chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heaven and places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him. See that? before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and not blame before him in love. When did he choose us in him? Before the foundation of the world. Before he ever created anything, he already planned. He had this purpose in himself that he had already planned it. Now, verse 4 is important because he says, according as he had chosen us, Where? Notice carefully, it does not say he chose us to be in him. That's not the Calvinist idea that back here, God looked down and he says, I'm going to choose you to be in Christ, I'm going to choose you to be out of Christ, I'm going to choose you to be in Christ, I'm going to choose you to be out. It says he chose us where? In him. Not to be in him, but in him. 
That's not looking down the future and saying, I'm going to put some people into Christ and I'm going to put some people over there. Where did God choose us? In Him. So if you're going to be one of the chosen, where do you have to be? In Him. How do you get in Him? You believe the gospel, right. How do you get into Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 13 says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into Jesus Christ. The moment you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, God the Holy Spirit takes you and identifies you into the Lord Jesus Christ, into his body. Makes you one with him. Puts you into Christ. That's what we call positional truth. The term in is talking about what position are you in. Where are you? Where are you located? He takes you out of Adam, out of your sin, puts you into his righteousness, takes you out of your, your condemnation, puts you into his acceptance, put, takes you out of Adam, puts you into Christ, gives you this new identity in, in Jesus Christ. Now, how do you get into Christ? Who does God put into Christ? Hold your hand here and come to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God. Now, look at here. He's got something he purposed in himself back here before the foundation of the world. To form this body of believers over here, this body of Christ. Okay? Here's this eternal purpose to form that body. How's he going to do it? Verse 21. It pleased God. Here is the sovereign free will and pleasure of Almighty God. By the foolishness of preaching. Now that's, that's not foolish preaching. That's the foolishness of preaching. What is that talking about? Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. By the foolishness that the world would think of the preaching of the cross to save them that he preordained before the foundation of the world had to believe. No. Who did God choose? Who before the foundation of the world did God say he was going to save? Them that believe. You see that? That one verse right there can save you from the darkness of theological fatalism called Calvinism. That one verse. Because that verse tells you who was it that God before the foundation of the world chose. He chose us in Him. How did He choose for you to get in Him? By believing the gospel. So when you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again for your justification, and you rely exclusively on Him, no church, no baptizing, no catechism, no walking the aisle, no living a good life, all that business, which you don't do anyway. I think it's so silly. I listen to these guys argue about, well, you know, you need to live this way. Yeah, what am I supposed to do? Well, you need to tithe and pa pass out tracts and, you know, okay, anybody can do that. You don't, but you could. He said, well, God told me the other day, he said, just don't get in any bad sin. <laughs> I was in prison. I, mean, I was preaching to a bunch of prisoners. <laughs> the guy said, just don't get in any bad sin. I said, what are you locked up in a maximum security prison for? <laughs> just don't do any more. And I said, well, what would be a bad sin that you shouldn't commit? And he had a little trouble coming up with one or two. So I said, well, let me give you some examples. Proverbs 6 says there are seven things God hates. One of them is a proud look. So let's just talk about pride. Oh. How many times a day do you think you might be proud? Well, I don't know. Well, let me give you an illustration. Do you ever watch somebody do something and you, you get irritated because you know you could do it better? He looked at me and says, about every time I go through the lunch line. <laughs> I could better do better than this stuff. <laughs> I said, okay, that's pride. So let's just do it once a day, 360 days in a year. That's 365 times a year. You're proud. You did something God hates. 
Now, if you went out and got drunk 365 times, everybody would say you're, a, you're an alcoholic, you know, and you're a drunkard, and God hates that. I don't know a verse that says that, but maybe you got one. Brother Reynolds at the mission used to say people get drunk on pride, and anybody could ever get drunk on Smirnoff. <laughs> you drink enough booze, it'll put you to sleep, knock you out. You can just keep sucking on, the, on, on that bottle of pride. And people say, well, you know, my point is all that stuff about what you're going to do is just going to put you in hell. Because what you do isn't going to, and you're going to stop doing, isn't going to help you. Because you don't stop it. Don't think stop sin is the cross. So getting saved is trusting Jesus Christ exclusively. Not saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to accomplish this, I'm going to accomplish that. It's saying, Lord, I can't save myself. I figured out I can't do this. I can't be perfect. That's what sin is, is not being perfect. So I need a perfect Savior. And when you cast off your doings and you just trust him exclusively, God says, you're the one I'm looking for. Because you're the one I'm going to put in my son. Because you're the one he died. You're the one he, he saves. He died for everybody. That's the one he saves. This is my eternal plan. Now, that plan that he had back on in the future, in the past, we're part of it. But that plan's got a future to it. It's going to last all the way out there. You know what? That in the ages to come, he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. In the ages to come, they're never going to end. They're just going to be one right after another, after another, after another, after another, everlastingly going. That's how long it's going to last. Folks, you're not going to spend your eternity in heaven trying to catch rainbow trout out of the stream of life. You're not going to be floating around on a cloud playing a harp and drinking mint and julep. I'm sorry. That's not what eternity is about. Eternity is about carrying on the business of God's heaven, exalting his son, demonstrating the exceeding greatness of his grace, coming to comprehend the love of Christ, which is past getting to the bottom of. Okay? He said, I want you to see how wide this is, it includes everybody. I want you to see that this is something that started back before the foundation of the world and is going to end out over there never ever. That's how long it is. The depth of it, look back at chapter 2 of Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse number 1. Here's the stuff, he, here's the material that he makes the body of Christ out of. And you hath he quickened, who were dead. You know what your problem is? It's not that you have this wrong idea about this, or you had this wrong theology about that, or you did this thing over here that you shouldn't have done. Or that. Your problem is you're dead. If the problem was you just didn't know enough, education would be the answer. If the problem isn't you isn't good enough, going out and doing some good things might be the answer. Your problem is you're dead in trespasses and sins. The wages of sin is death. Your sin produces death, separation from God, separation from one another, alienation in relations, separation from yourself. You're dead in trespasses and sin. Not only are you dead... Wherein in time past you walked. So wait a minute, how can a dead man walk? Because death isn't cessation of existence. Death in the Bible is not don't exist. Death in the Bible is I don't function properly. I'm alienated. I'm separated. Wherein in time past you walk, but you're not going to walk the way God created you to walk. Wherein in time past you walk according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of what? 
So you're disobedient in sin, and you're out here walking in a world that carries on the philosophy of the adversary, and it's his spirit driving you, motivating you, pushing you, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past of the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And when I read that, I said, that's kind of a sad description. The psalmist says, he lifted me up out of the, the pit of miry clay and set my feet on a rock. You know what God does? He reaches down into the, to the mire and the muck of your sin. Of your life, following the lust of your flesh and the desires of your mind, doing what you want to do. And you know what it does? It produces death. Sin complicates life. The wages of sin is death. And you get all the way to the place where you're willing to call light, darkness, and darkness, light, and evil, good, and good, evil. And he reaches right down to the depth of it. Did you know that you can't out -sin the grace of God? What a good message that is. If I know anything... I know that's probably the hardest thing people have to believe. I learned years ago preaching. I don't need to stand up here and beat you to death. A lot of people think that's what good preaching is. I'll get after something every now and then and, you know, really jump on sin or something and somebody go out and say, boy, that's good preaching this morning, Brother Rick. <laughs> okay. I believe in correction and reproof. But some people think that if I if preacher just tells you what you shouldn't do, tell you what you ought to do that you aren't doing, if that's good preaching. And I think, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> because the key isn't, listen, you know how to beat yourself up better than I do. I'll talk about something sometimes. Somebody will come around and say, did so-and-so talk to you about me? <laughs> I had a man met me right over that, that fire extinguisher. I was standing by the fire extinguisher one day. And he says, you've been talking to my wife. <laughs> and I said, no, but should I? Well, you sounded like it. Well, that's that thing in 1 Corinthians 14. You know, if the shoe fits, wear it. The point is, you know how to beat yourself up already. The grace of God says where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. You see, the depth of this is that it reaches right down to the lowest point that you get in. Down south used to say, that guy is lower than a snake's belly in a wagon rut. Right down the bottom. And reaches right down there. And sometimes it's the bent towards lasciviousness. Sometimes it's the bent towards sinfulness. Sometimes uh, of, of uh, uh, vile and vicious things and terrible things. Sometimes it's the bent toward aestheticism, that true of the knowledge of good and evil. And sometimes you're caught in, in the pride of religion and the pride of place and the pride of face and, and all that kind of stuff. And then you come to realize, I'm lost. And he says, God's grace goes right there right down to the bottom where the children of wrath even as others are. And it saves you from the guttermost to the uttermost. And then he says the heights. You're there in chapter 2. Keep reading verse 6. 
hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He takes you and me, undeserving, wretches, outcast, separated, sinful. I think of that verse, in fact, I don't know if you heard the radio program this morning, but I kept making a point on the radio about in, First Corinthians, in Romans chapter 1, one of the things that Paul says is a description of a reprobate mind is they have no understanding. Ephesians, he says, we have the ability to comprehend. Brings you from that position that sin puts you in of not knowing what's going on. Thinking you do. And being blind as a bat flying backwards in a dark cave. Puts you into Christ. And then he seats you with him in the heavenly places. Now that's not, that's not mysticism. To be seated with him together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We've studied this at great detail. It's the issue in chapter 1. You and I, as members of the body of Christ, will share in the government of the heavens with him. You've been made a part of his family and his program. And for that eternal purpose, you're going to have a job and a function and a purpose in the heavenlies. Now when I read all that and I think, wow, if I, can get a, if, I, if I can get a grip, if my mind can get a grip on all of that, Job says, we can't get it. Now because it's been revealed to me in his word, I have the ability to understand it. Not because I'm smart, but because God has revealed it to me in his word. Now it's here. And Paul says, I'm praying for you that all this stuff that I've talk, talked to you about, the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, all this eternal, per, all this plan, this cosmic plan that God has in His Son that He's made you a part of because you're in Christ, I want you to comprehend. How did you get your mind around it? And when you get your mind around it, it's going to give you the capacity to know the love of Christ in a way you could have never known it otherwise that passes knowledge, that limitless, unending process of knowing him more and more. We have a song in the songbook. It says, could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the sky of parchment made? And every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. That's how big God's love is. If you want to understand, get a grip. Get around the flagpole, a good grip. You get it by understanding the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of what God's doing today. When you grasp the vastness of what God is doing in His plans and purposes in Christ, then you're going to really know, understand the love of Christ, the greatness of His eternal purpose based upon Calvary's love. Right division, understand the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, leads to knowing the love of Christ. It's the love of Christ that constrains us into service. To be a grace believer is not simply to know how to rightly divide the word. Understanding how to rightly divide the word is so that you can be a real grace believer. So that in your life, the reality of who God's made you in Christ can be the reality of your life. 
in its details. And prayer. Paul's praying. He teaches the doctrine. Chapter 1 to 3. He's going to show you the life that it produces. Chapter 4, 5, and 6. And this prayer is the link. Because prayer is the catalyst to take the sound doctrine and to put it into the details of your life day by day. It's you talking to God on the basis of the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, on the basis of knowing the love of Christ, comprehending it, grasping it, talking to God in light of all that about what's going on in your life and how life, your life fits into his will that brings that life into your life. So wherever you are and whatever you face, whatever your life is today, tomorrow, this week, it's a matter of taking that truth, looking at your life, and bringing that truth there and saying, by faith. Christ dwells in your heart by faith. Your faith is what releases that strengthening of the Spirit in your inner man. It produces that life. So you can comprehend the incomprehensible. For some people, the Christian life is a totally incomprehensible thing. It's not designed to be that way by God. It's designed for your faith to rest in an understanding of what God's doing and how he's made that a part, you a part of it, and it a part of you. If you've come in here this morning and you've never really passed from death to life, you don't know for sure. If you were to stand before God today and he would say, why would I let you into my heaven? And you'd have to stutter a moment and think about what should I say to him. Can I tell you, you can know for sure. You don't need to wonder. You don't need to guess. Jesus Christ went to Calvary to pay for everything that's wrong with you. God commended his love towards you. And then while you were yet a sinner, you weren't trying to fix anything, make it better, do, do better. Christ died for you. That's why Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. To him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. The moment you quit trust in yourself and your self-will and you rely exclusively on him, that instant, God will save you. He looks down at your heart. He doesn't look at your outward man. Unfortunately, we do that. He looks at your heart. And he wants to see your faith resting exclusively in his son. The moment you do that, he'll save you. He said, well, I didn't feel anything. Got, he got nothing to do with it. That comes from understanding. It's what God does. Right where you sit, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to move a muscle. You don't have to pray. You don't have to make deals with God, anybody else. Just trust his son. God will save you. If you never did that. Right now it's time to do that. If there's something in your mind that's not clear, there are people sitting all over this auditorium, rooms full of people, they'd be happy to sit and talk with you with an open Bible until it's clear for you. But you don't need us. You need him. Trust him. For those of us that are saved, we need to trust him too. We need to remember the gospel's ours too. And we need to rejoice in his love, the love of Christ for us. Father, we thank you today that indeed it was our Savior that provides us life. We thank you that we can understand, we can comprehend to some small degree your love for us. We give you the praise for that in Christ's name.